CityCast from Explicity. On the 7th of May 1982, at 11.30 in the morning, I got an appointment with the good doctor. He had a clinic on the posh 5th Avenue, way downtown on 11th Street. In my handbag, I had two fresh packets of Dunhill, then very difficult to find in the US. I waited in the doctor's outer office, somewhat nervous and not very optimistic. His assistant came out and asked me to fill a form. I filled it and handed it back. $200, please, she said, stretching out a hand. Oof, that was steep. I handed it to her and was asked to wait. Dr. Fleischer looked very old and grizzled. He was bent with a decided hump. So, I am told that you are a dancer and an actress and this should be easy for you. It's all about imagining things and you must have a powerful imagination to be an artist. He then asked me to open my bag. I did so grudgingly. Two packets of Dunhill fell out. He took them, threw them on the floor and jumped on them several times. My heart sank. My thrifty Gujarati self also thought of how many dollars that was worth. British imported cigarettes were very expensive in those days, besides being difficult to find. You won't need those anymore, he said, smiling cherubically. I grimaced inwardly. He asked me to relax on the chaise long. I am going to count down from five. By the time I come to one, you will be completely hypnotized. Fat chance, I said to myself. I shut my eyes. His voice changed to a soft and dreamy one. He started counting down. My thoughts continued to be skeptical, disbelieving that anyone could go under so easily. My mind was still racing as he said, Now you are completely in my control. I want you to imagine a hill and meadows and a lovely breeze. Now imagine you are running up the hill. Your lungs are clear. Now you are not huffing and out of breath. You are energetic. Your lungs fill with oxygen. Run. Enjoy it. I'm listening. I'm awake. I'm scoffing at what he's saying. Smoking has not yet had the effect of making me breathless. I can run up a hill without huffing and puffing. My lungs are clear. This is nonsense. What a waste of my packets of cigarettes and $200. I could have done so much with that amount of money. Meanwhile, the good doctor was still speaking to me. Now he asked me to imagine a mouth with cancer, the awful holes, the pain, the agony, the inability to open my mouth. I imagine all of the same to myself. Yarth actress hai Malika. All you are doing is acting as though you are hypnotized. And then I heard him say, I am going to count again from five to one. When I say one, you will be fully awake. Yeah, big deal, I thought. I've not been asleep, so how can I awaken? He counted down. I opened my eyes, pretending to have been deep in a hypnotic state. I stood up, he picked up a card from his desk and handed it to me. I am in Miami and LA every week. This card has all my numbers. If you feel like lighting up, call me. Collect. Anytime. And he showed me out. I was early for a lunch date with my prospective husband, so I decided to walk uptown instead of taking a subway. And as I walked, my eyes searched for a cigarette shop that may sell Dunhill. I waited for the urge. It did not come. Not then, not since. It is 40 years since this encounter. I have felt no urge to smoke. Nor did I feel the need to overeat to compensate for not smoking as I had so many times earlier. Yes, for the first week or so, my fingers felt lost not holding a cigarette, as did my lips. And my supari box remained full, but that is all. Four decades. And I still don't believe I was hypnotized. Being raised by parents who are very famous has its benefits, but equally, it is difficult to emerge from their shadows in which one must twist and then find a spot upstage for one's creativity. 
Growing up in India in the 70s was materially different from what it seems to be today, materially being the operative expression, because there was not much money to go around. For example, it didn't really matter what sort of car you drove because there weren't many automotive choices. I'll spare you the litany of examples of what else you could not do, but the good thing was there were other ways by which you gained respect in society being well-educated, well-informed, and well-spoken, and not merely rich. This is the domain of the nerds. In America, nerds are objects of derision. In India, they are favored candidates for matrimony. We marry them on priority. And in the time when regular middle-income folks had no choice but to study hard and get a good job, being liberal towards one's children was something that was highly risky like sending your kids to a Montessori school, potentially denying them the feral ability to claw and elbow their way into a packed city bus. My guest today is Malika Sarabai. She sums up all of the foregoing. She had famous parents, Mrinalini and Vikram Sarabai. She went to a Montessori school. And then she graduated from the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, a prestigious blue-chip institution, and then went on to get a PhD in management by the time she was 22. And then she devoted her life to the arts. And until her friends made her change it, she drove an old Indian SUV, an SUV so that her many dogs could fit comfortably. Malika's recent book is titled In Free Fall, My Experiments with Living. It is not so much an autobiography as a memoir of specific events in her life and of a self-realization that she gained through curing her different illnesses through alternate medicine. Reading her book is to connect those dots to see a picture of her that is candid and funny and for all the descriptions of her troubles is never tragic. In a minute, you'll understand why. Let's meet her. Malika Sarabai, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you very much. Barely out of your teens, you graduated from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and then did a PhD in organizational behavior, wasn't it? Yes. You were 22, and Dr. Yes. Malika Sarabai. Yes. But those academic heights had their origins in a Montessori school. What was that like? My grandmother heard about Madame Montessori, Mm -hmm. resonated completely with the idea of the parent being like a gardener, providing soil and water, but not ikebanaing the plants. Mm -hmm. In, I think it was 1913, she got to know about Madame Montessori's work and went by ship to England for a three-week workshop, convinced her to come and set up a school and set up a school for my father and his seven siblings uh, in, a, in a building in the family compound. And from that experience of Montessori kind of education where Pandit Nehru would come and teach history for a while and cool. Rabindranath Tagore would come and talk about music and talk about philosophy. So it was that kind of a place. And Papa had this little laboratory where he used to try all manner of experiments. From that experience, when the next generation was growing up, my two aunts uh, decided that they wanted to provide that kind of a schooling for not only their children, but for any other child of any other parent who didn't want uh, their children to go through how a clerk is trained in the IAS. And so they started this school called Shreyas and I studied there. It was a school where I was completely unaware that there are caste or religious or color or racial differences we were six in a class. Everybody did everything. I was the only woman on the football team. Uh, the guys all learned dancing. I nearly chopped off my hand learning carpentry. Uh, it was that kind of a school. That sounds idealistic, but were you maladjusted for the rest of education to follow? Uh, and from this kind of a school, I go into St. Xavier's College, where there are 100 kids in the class, and everybody is only talking about how they will manipulate the system to get a first class. How? Who do I know? My uncle knows the invigilator. Oh, I have somebody in the university who can see that marks. Are... And I just could not understand it. Naive as I was, coming from the kind of family I came from, 
the fact of shortcutting the system had never occurred to me. And I had a professor of the head of department of economics and I was studying economics and I was playing badminton for the college. Uh, and I had this conversation with him in the first two months of my, my first term where he said, uh, how can you possibly get a first class if you wear such short shorts? Hmm. And I thought, and I said to him, are you looking at my legs or my paper? Right. And of course, got thrown out of class instantly. There you go. But this was my uh, sort of experience of college. And I kept on saying, why is everybody being corrupt? And where did that question lead you? This was a question that I took into the IIM with me without an answer. And while I was in the second year of IIM, a Harvard professor called David McClelland came to do a lecture at IIM and he was working on something called the need for power. Mm -hmm. And his lecture on what he was looking for absolutely fitted my question, why do people take shortcuts? So my PhD, in fact, was the first study ever done under him on why India is corrupt. So what was the frame of reference for your PhD? Uh, what were the questions? What is it that separates the people who don't take the shortcut mm -hmm. from the people who do take the shortcut? Are there demographic reasons? Are there familial reasons? Are there reasons of who studies in English medium and who in Gujarati and who in Hindi? Is it economic? What is it? And what was the answer? The answer was very simple. If a child had been told by an adult, whether it was a parent or a friend or a teacher, that life isn't fair. You have to enjoy the process of education. You may or may not get the marks you think you should get, but that shouldn't break you. You need somebody to have leveled with you very early in life to tell you that it's not okay. It's, it's, it's not fair. Life is not fair, but it's not about fairness. It's about enjoying every moment of what you are doing. It's about gaining from that moment. It's the Bhagavad Gita. It's not the fruit. It's the process. And what would you say to people who believe that uh, patronage is culturally endemic to India and from patronage, nepotism, corruption, that whole bag of tricks. And in fact, some of it may not even be seen as corruption in the Western sense. Sati was culturally a part of our system. We got rid of that. True. There were many other things that, are, that were barbaric uh, that we are trying to get rid of. My friend... Uh, Bezwara Wilson is at the moment on a nationwide padayatra to try and stop manual scavenging. Uh, we still have attacks on Dalits every day for wearing a moustache, for wearing a shirt, for climbing a horse uh, when he's getting married. Uh, we still have brutal attacks, actually more today than even a few years ago. Right. That doesn't mean we stop having to change. We just have to change. And is it? You know, I find that more people today than even five years ago are looking for something more than a pay packet. They are developing a concern for ethical practices, for practices that are good for nature, that practices that do not lead to slavery by other names. And that gives me hope. So after all these academic milestones, tell me what went right. <laughs> well, who do we thank for your talents being saved from the corporate world? <laughs> I never wanted to go into the corporate world. I was always very keen that I wanted to work with people. I hadn't found dance, but I knew that I wanted to work in the development sector. You know, my dreams as a child were built by my father. Uh, I used to sit on his lap when he planned the man management institute in Ahmedabad. And I would often say to him, why are, you, why are you building this? And he would explain to me how India as a new country had to have public institutions, be they hospitals or educational institutions or institution to deal with farmers and to educate farmers or, or other things. He was already talking of space and, and satellites that could guide people. And he said that these would require professionally trained managers. Otherwise, India would never leapfrog into the next century. We would often sit and talk about how the minute I graduated from IIM, he would retire and we would spend all our time building the kind of public institutions that this country needed. 
so it was never that I wanted to go into uni Unilever or whatever. But I had a great luck, like all the boys in my class, having a three-piece suit stitched and going to all the interviews and then having the great pleasure of saying no to some of the biggest firms. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me great pleasure. <laughs> That's not without its own perversion. <laughs> Now let's talk about your book, In Free Fall, My Experiments with Living. Now that's not exactly an autobiography. Of sorts. Of sorts. Of sorts. <laughs> what led you to write this book? What was the tipping point? You know, for years, people have come up to me and said, you know, I saw you 20 years ago and you look exactly the same. What is your secret? Or somebody seeing me dance after 15 years or 30 years or whatever, saying, you know, where do you get this energy from? And I would always laugh and say, ha, I'll tell you someday. And when COVID happened, this is the time to talk about health and wellness. And it was when I was about 27, 28, wellness became a part of my thinking rather than thinness. You know, we only have one body and we treat it like garbage. And we expect it to work for us. You know, there is no greater joy than the joy of feeling well. Just the joy that everything works and I can do whatever I want. You can have every other accolade. You can have every other wealth. You can have your own yacht. But if your toenail breaks and you are in <laughs> agony about something as silly as that, and you know it can, or a toothache. Oh, yes, yeah, say no more. Then I thought, I have had such a strange journey from the empty cellar to the smoking to the, uh, to, 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 to the psychic surgeons. To, and I just sat down and I wrote it. I just wrote it. And, and that book is a trove of the ailments that you have been forced to overcome. Yes, and it's also a trove of all the alternate medicine therapies and cures that you studied and uh, summarized. And that is to your conviction. And in my belief that Western science, which we look to for proof of everything, is about a thousand years behind what was Indian wisdom. You know, you have chapters of summaries of so many alternate medicine avenues, you know, like you mentioned. And I like that. I love those passages on uh, chromotherapy and uh, yeah. clearly on photography that my mother introduced me to. Really? And she came back from, yeah, oh yeah. She came back from a seminar somewhere in Spain with a lot of this. And, and I said, well, what? And she sat and told me all about uh, acrylion photography. And now I'm talking about... 40 years ago. The, uh, yeah, something like 40 that. 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. About. That's when I read about it and first saw those pictures as well. It's good science. But so much of it has fallen lately to charlatanism and, uh, you know, opportunism in the form of low entry barriers. And anyone can get certified without effort, without knowledge. Exactly. You know, in, in Gujarati, the word tarat uh -huh. means instant. So okay. I often say that people don't teach Bharatanatyam, they teach Taratanatyam because they've taken two classes and they become <laughs> guru bubbly or guru pimple or guru something else. Guru... I mean... There are givers and there are takers. There are takers. That's why it's it's popular. I wish I knew how to be a guru and make a business of it. You know, uh, bubbly and pimple are taken. I could be guru carbuncle. But no business sense. Born in the wrong state, I'm afraid, Malika. <laughs> I'm born in the wrong state. I don't have a business gene in my body. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in common. Now, I would have thought, and I admit stereotypically, that... One of the things that defined you would be an active feminism. But you wrote an article titled, Feminism? Who's that? And this passage I'd like to quote from one of your articles. But when did we, a country where the majority of people were the inheritors of the Ardhanadishwara, ally ourselves with this totally foreign concept of women trying to catch up with men on the men's terms? What a woman. So when? Well, I think it happened with the Manusmruti. I think when we started taking Manusmruti as one of our great books, and Manu defines women as 
only being somebody in the context of a male, be it father, son, brother, husband, and talks of women saying that if they do not follow you, this concept of following was not earlier part of our ethos, uh, beats them like a drum, he says, Mr. Manu. And I think that is when patriarchy really came to the fore. Because for the proponents of Hindutva today, the whole idea of women being in the rasoi is actually, and women not questioning, actually nobody questioning. It goes so completely against our Upanishads and the Vedas where everything was because of a question. And the women were questioning as much and arguing as much as the men were. And the definition of them was not by gender. It was by intellect. But in a country where intellect is today seen as uh, something to be laughed at mm -hmm. and something to be thrown into the garbage can, uh, sure. what can one expect? You know, right there in that, in that short piece that you wrote is another book. <laughs> the premise is fascinating. You studied Kalari? I did. And the martial arts from the Northeast. Was that Sarit Sarak or the other one? Tang Tangta. Tangta. So what was it like? Did you study the martial arts form or the dance form of the martial arts form? No, you know, when I, when I, came, when I came out of uh, the Mahabharata, I was pretty certain that I couldn't go back into being a Bharatanatyam or Kuchipudi dancer who danced pieces written in other centuries. The effect of Draupadi on women, of my interpretation of Draupadi on women of all types, was such that I realized that my activist self had its best expression through my arts. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to create something different. And one of the things that had always bothered me is about how language weakens women, especially Indian languages. So, for instance, a woman's definition is always man less something. That's how a word is used. And I thought that, you know, whether it's language or it's the way language is used, women are put down. Speaking of interpretation, you mentioned the Mahabharata. Now, you wrote that you had a problem with Peter Brook's interpretation of uh, Draupadi. And of all the women. Uh -huh. uh, you were specifically concerned with the interpretation of Draupadi as a wimp. Yes, in his interpretation. Okay, but why is there so much room for interpretation for a character like Draupadi? Draupadi is a very difficult woman to define because we do not like nuanced definitions. We do not have the time for it. We didn't have the time for it then. Peter is an Anglo-Saxon white male. He defines women as shrews, and non-shrews. I define women as shaktis and non-shaktis. So the first clash was when very early on in rehearsal, he said, Malika, don't raise your voice. You sound like a shrew. And I said, Peter, we do not have shrews. We have shaktis. And if you didn't want shaktis, you should have chosen the Ramayana, not the Mahabharata. Truly. And it took a lot of my educating him Anyway, so, you know, the whole concept of Ardhanarishwara, of, of there not being something that was feminine that was not strong or something that was feminine that meant weakness or meant vulnerability. And Draupadi says, in, in, I, I, and I made them understand that those lines were important at the beginning of the second section when they've just gone into exile. Draupadi says to Yudhishthira basically that, I love you, but that doesn't stop me telling you that you're a very weak man and that you lied and that your addiction has put us all in this situation. And that Yudhishthira, I have a brain and I have a womb and I use them both. I don't apologize for either one of them. And that is an incredibly nuanced uh, view of feminism and of Shakti and of femininity. And I think, but I think by the end of the rehearsal period, which was a long rehearsal period, Peter was very open to doing this and open to accepting this for all the women. Seems wonderfully cerebral. Do you suppose that in the arts in India, there is as much bandwidth in the interpretation of uh, Draupadi? 
No, no, of course there isn't. <laughs> you put on uh, lots of jewellery and a crown and you get anybody from Rama to Hanuman. You know, Hanuman has to be very angry looking. Hanuman really has to look like the Hulk today to be Hanuman. Uh, but you put on tinsel and makeup and uh, orange tilaks and uh, lots of jewellery, lots of glitter. And you have whoever you want and it's the, it's the LKG version of <laughs> all of them. And some of our most... Most popular writers feed into that, feed into into Rama with the six pack and uh, forget the forget the other Rama, the gentle Rama, the the I mean forget all about that. <laughs> Even that nuance has gone. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. Anyway, while researching you, I went down one rabbit hole and found Ketu Katrak's book, Contemporary Indian Dance. Yeah, struggled through it. It's not my jam. <laughs> It was hard. <laughs> anyway, in the book, in the drama In Search of the Goddess, it says that you had Draupadi refer to her marriage to five men as shared by five, a commodity in the marketplace. Now explain to me what's wimp in that context. My Draupadi is a Virangana. And that means? This was, she, she is a warrior for truth. Uh -huh. She is a warrior for a spade being called a spade. Now, I have to tell you the history of this poem that I created into the dance piece that then went into In Search of the Goddess. My brother, who is neither poetic nor somebody given to emotions like I am, and who is very cautious and diametrically the opposite of everything that I am, came to Avignon especially to see the Mahabharata in its first month. Kartike doesn't understand French. The play was in French. It finished at 6.30 in the morning and he sat down and he wrote a poem in Gujarati called I Draupadi. And it's the most feminist piece of writing on mythology that I have ever seen. And that is what I translated into Tamil to set it to Bharatanatyam and into English, which I spoke. So it says, for instance, the last lines are, Our lives we pass together, going on a long journey towards the snow-clad Himalaya and so on. And then she says, I fell first. No Pandava stretched a hand. Towards paradise they walked, not one stayed by my side. Then I realized heaven too must be only for men. Better than to rest in the warm embrace of this snow. That's beautiful. I mean, what greater indictment can there possibly be? That after 40 years of being married to five men, Bhima protecting her all the time, Arjuna always off with some other gal, Yudhishthira being the presumptuous, self-righteous person that he was, uh, the other two being like her two twins, that she says better than the warm embrace of the snow. And, and it is in that context that she says, what was my mother-in-law thinking of? That in her righteousness, she says, share it. And it's decided that I will be shared. Did anybody ask me? I fell in love with Arjuna. But nobody asked me. Yudhishthira decided that as the eldest brother, this was a great idea. So what happened to me as a person? And the other question she asks is, in the, in the gambling court, she says, yes, Krishna gave me cloth, but where was the Gita's truth? Was Arjuna not in need of that counsel then, Krishna? Why did you wait so many years for the Gita to happen on the Kurukshetra thing? Was, was ethics and goodness and dharma and righteousness not broken then for the first time? You also have an agenda, Krishna. Speaking of agendas, I'm sure that over the years, people have said to you, oh, you should be in politics. <laughs> and, and you entered politics. So was that time that you ran for office your one occasion at the hustings? It was my one occasion, but it came out, out of five years of going around the country telling people that I want 200 people who will give up seven years of their life 
for the development of this country. I don't care what your politics are. I don't care who you believe in. If you believe that India can become a developed country, if its funds and its policies are correctly used, then join me. If we stand for election after two years of working in a particular constituency, being known for good work, and then we stand, even if 30 or 40 people get elected to parliament, it will be a huge voice. And we, we will decide that we are not going to scratch anybody's back. Nobody's going to scratch ours. We are only here to prove a point, which is that development funds properly channelized can actually be transformative. I couldn't find a single person who was willing to throw their hat into the ring. So I did it as an experiment. And it was the biggest learning curve of my life. And I don't regret it one minute. Yeah. And maybe you should stay the course. Don't you think that it's about time that we had a prime minister from Gujarat? <laughs> I consider myself a Dravid Kutti. So you are part Gujarati, part Tambram, and part uh, Malayali? Uh, but that's right. I am a true mongrel, the kind India disowns today. <laughs> well, at least we have the Tambram part in common. <laughs> I think we have a lot more in common. <laughs> I agree. And on that note, Malika Sarabhai. Thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. I had a great time too. Hopefully we'll meet again before my next book. That would be my privilege. And that was the renowned and charming Malika Sarabhai. Her book, In Free Fall, My Experiments with Living, is available everywhere that books are available. And there's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy the book. And I'll be back with that fun segment, What's That Word? Where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And I'm back with What's That Word? And my co-host. Hello. My name is Praniti. But you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. What's on your toast today? Marmite. Really? Marmite? Yeah, I love the taste of Marmite. What sort? Is that veggie Marmite? I have no idea what they put in it. And I don't want to read the label. This might not inspire me. I agree. Label reading never ends well. <laughs> yeah, my parents never made me read the label, except to look for uh, expiration dates of medicines. And for that, I'm an obsessive label reader. Has it occurred to you that taking the trouble to read the label of a food product might be a great way to avoid having to read... The labels the, on uh, medicines, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Hemingway. <laughs> What? That's just absurd. What does Hemingway have to do with preventative medicine? Well, Hemingway knew how to fix everything. <laughs> you know, he's the correct answer to the question, who's your daddy? <laughs> Why else would they call him Papa Hemingway? <laughs> All right, P with an A, what's that word? <laughs> You're too funny. And anyway, you know what? You're right on target without even knowing it. Today, I want to discuss the etymology of Papa and Mama. Why? Because in your interview with Malika Sarabhai, uh, I totally loved the interview, by the way. She is so Thanks. funny. And, you know, she referred to her father, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, several times as Papa. Yeah, right. What about it? Just that I was watching the speech that Prince Charles, I mean, make that King Charles. Yeah. And he referred to his mother as Mamo. Yes, he did. And you want to discuss? Mama and Papa. You know, they're universal the world over. Mm -hmm. And it can't be by coincidence that in every single language in the world, mother is a variation of ma and father is pa. What an interesting pick for what's that word. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. First, let's get the commonly understood reason uh, for Mama and Papa being what they are. What, what have you read about this occurrence? Well, only what everyone says, you know, which mm -hmm. is that it's, it's based on the first syllables uttered by a child. Uh, yeah, that's what people believe. Yeah, but there must be more signs to this linguistic similarity. There is, and surprisingly technical, the uh, the linguistics for Mama and Papa. There's a lot I had to read to get to this point. And I found the research to be amazingly vast. But 
for here, I'll just do the quick and dirty version. Yay, that's what this show is about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the most popular theory is that while babbling, babies create what is known as proto-words. That's proto-words is by combining nonsensical uh, combinations of consonants and vowels. And these babies, all babies, <laughs> use, use soft <laughs> consonants to babble. The easiest ones for them are M sound followed by A sound. And uh, that's ma, you see. And this is quickly right. followed by the B, the P, and the soft T, all followed with an A. Very similar to P with an A. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> and this resulted in sounds like mama, papa, dada, tata, baba, you see. Right. And so babies refer to their parents by these words. Now, this is where the contrarians step in and etymologists go to war with parents. Oh no, what sort of battle? While these babies babble with the easiest sounds that come to them, proud parents, spotting early genius in their infants, start to believe that the babies are actually <laughs> referring to them. So, <laughs> so the first is mama. Now it stands to reason that the mother hears that babbling sound first and then decides that the baby is referring to her. Right? <laughs> For all you know, the baby is using Zaza and Gugu to refer to her. <laughs> but she rewards the baby with a jolly good feed every time mama is heard. <laughs> and, and, then, and then the father comes home from his hunt in the local <laughs> pub. Right? And soon hears Dada which he distinguishes from mama. And many years later, the child learns that saying dada gets it all kinds of money and treats. <laughs> and what about zaza and goo goo? See, all these other noises are turned back on the child, all right, because they're inconvenient. <laughs> so, so the child progressively becomes zaza and goo goo, and it com completely confuses the baby, poor baby. Anyway... Parents attribute all genius to these sounds, but they are no more than mouth noises. And then <laughs> hearing that, they decide that mama meant mother, and then closely following that, dada. <laughs> oh, dear. New parents are simply going to love this. <laughs> oh, let them. You know, they can postpone drafting that Nobel acceptance speech for their progeny. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like there was a lot of research on mama and papa. A surprising amount. In the 1950s, the American anthropologist George Murdoch examined the words for mother and father in 470 languages from all over the world. And he mm. found that 52% of the languages had an M sound for mother and 55% had the D or the P, importantly, sound for father. So reasonably confused or surprised by his findings, he floated an appeal to the community at large to find out more about this coincidence. And etymologists around the world plucked the comforters from the mouths of babies and contributed <laughs> richly to this research. So there's more in the debunking of the popular belief that infants are speaking than one would think. Such as? Well, there's a brilliant essay by a guy called Larry Trask on this titled, Where do Mama and Papa words come from? I have the PDF, and if anyone's interested, they can write to us and I will uh, mail it to them. Yeah. For listeners, our email ID is tlc at explosity.com. And it's in the podcast description. Thank you. Okay. So Trask summarized, you know, he summarized the conclusion that babies are trying to talk. He said that that was not correct. He writes, and I quote, there is absolutely no evidence that babbling children are trying to speak. And in fact, linguists are pretty sure that they aren't. Babbling appears to be no more than a way of experimenting with the vocal tract, and babble sounds like mama and dada are not intended as meaningful utterances, but the parents think otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and that PDF mentions other sources, notably Roman or Roman, however you pronounce it, Jacobson, who is um, referenced for two works of his. One is the 1962 book, phonological studies, and the other one, I forget which. Anyway, he calls the appropriation of these baby sounds for words false cognates. 
Wow, who would have thought? I mean, this just stands everything on its head. Hmm. But tell me, isn't it still amazing that every language has ma for mother and pa for father? Well, not every language. No? But remember, I said Murdoch found this occurrence in over 50% of the languages, but that's not 100%. Mm, right, yeah. And you know, in some languages, the ma and the pa is actually reversed. Really? Like? In, in a tribal Australian language, papa <laughs> is mother. Mm. And in Georgian, in the, the Kartvelian or Kartvelian language, has mama for father and papa for mother. Amazing. That is so woke. <laughs> well, closer to home in Karnataka, in, uh, in, the, in the Tulu language, the word for father is ame. Ah. And, and you know, in some languages, the words for father and mother are not mama and papa related at all. What? Really? Like what languages? Like your mother tongue, for example. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. In Kannada, it's tai and tande. Yeah. It is. It is. It is. Same words in Kannada, Telugu, and Tamil. But in dialect, it's ama and appa, but that's probably acquired. Yeah. Wow. Never thought about it. That's our motto. Never thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in short, when babies say mama, they don't really mean their mother. Hey, you know, I mean, it's easier to assume that than assuming that the baby will come out calling the mother by its full name, you know. <laughs> think, think, just think about the utter chaos that would ensue if the baby referred to his mother as, uh, hello, Honoria Chumley. <laughs> or closer home, the baby calls her mother, hello, Visalakshi Braithwaite. <laughs> what sort of a name is Visalakshi Braithwaite? <laughs> a real one. I know her. <laughs> You know, <laughs> this girl, Visal, actually married a poor, unsuspecting Braithwaite. <laughs> and how did that go? It all ended in tears. <laughs> and that's what I'll do this evening. It will all end in a drink. Bye. And that's our show. Thank you so much for being here and for listening. I'd like to thank my guest, Malika Sarabai, and my uh, co-host, Pranati P with an A, Madhav. And now, before you go, just head to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and hit that subscribe button, or whatever they call it. And never miss an episode of The Literary City. See you again next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs>